During the Cold War, secret Nazi technology was used in Britain to build an advanced rocket plane designed to fly to the edge of space to hunt high-flying Russian bombers. The British Royal Air Force was still equipped with obsolete World War II fighters and slow jets. It now demanded a pure rocket aeroplane interceptor to kill the Russian bombers. A fighter like the original ME-163, but with substantially more fuel. We realized that the comet was in its own way, way ahead of its time in, in the war. And uh, although its application was limited, that was due to the fact that the rocket fuel was used so quickly. But its flying characteristics had tremendous potential. But the first designs suffered from the same defect as the original Comet. The rocket motor would burn up fuel too fast. Every possible corner of the aircraft would be filled with volatile rocket fuel. Even then, calculations showed the range would still be too short. And pilots were also less than enthusiastic about the idea of gliding home like the old ME-163 and landing a plane full of explosive fumes. This problem of how to get optimum performance from a very limited load of rocket fuel and then fly safely with a powered landing was a major stumbling block for the British designers. But in the early 1950s, a breakthrough was made. The solution was simple, but it was ingenious. The SR-53 carried two engines. Above was a tiny jet engine called the Viper. Below was a liquid-fueled rocket motor, the de Havilland Spectre. This was the main combat power plant. But the British had made a breakthrough with the Spectre, solving the dangerous fuel problems that had made the Messerschmitt Comet dangerous to fly. The SR-53 weighed nearly 7,000 kilos and the tiny wings spanned 8 meters. It was armed only with missiles, two de Havilland Firestreak infrared-guided air-to-air missiles on the wingtips. The prototype SR-53, serial number XD-145, was first flown on the 16th of May 1957. We were all getting uh, ready to go to the Farnborough show in 57, I think it was, and um, we obviously had a lot of pressure on us politically to get something done. So we um, produced the aeroplane fairly quickly with only two tanks of HTP. And um, John Booth was the test pilot of the day, and he made a very, very successful first flight out of Boscombe Down, landing back on. Um, using the Viper, of course, for the approach and landing. And so everything functioned su superbly on day one. The SR-53 had to sacrifice weight in order to get its phenomenal rate of climb. In West Germany, the newly reconstituted Luftwaffe, whose officers and leaders had fought against the RAF and Allies in World War II, now had other priorities how to meet and counter the threat of Soviet bombers and fighter bases that were only a few minutes away in East Germany. Interceptors taking off would have only seconds to shoot down the attacking Soviet aircraft. So the decision was taken, West Germany would buy the SR-177 rocket fighter. Germany began negotiations to build its own version of the SR-177. The German company chosen to manufacture it was Heinkel. Manufacturer of the World War II HE-111 bomber. But the Heinkel company had also built the world's first rocket-powered aircraft. The HE-176 in 1939. The first flight was planned for the spring of 1958. The production version would be 16 meters long. 
maximum speed would be Mark 2.35. It was planned to put the SR-177 into service in 1960. Meanwhile, the SR-53 program continued as a way of gathering experience in rocket fighter combat. But storm clouds were gathering over the British rocket fighter. Now, the SR-177 faced a new foe. It was an American aircraft called the missile with a man in it. It had a short range, and its stubby wings could carry little in the way of bombs and missiles. In addition, the Starfighter lacked true all-weather capability, which made it incapable of operating in conjunction with America's defensive radar system. A desperate Lockheed now offered the Starfighter to West Germany and NATO in competition with the SR-177. On the 15th of May, 1958, an SR-53 went supersonic for the first time, proving the bigger SR-177 was still a contender for the deal of the century. We used to go supersonic uh, out of Boscombe Down in the direction of uh, Bournemouth, Lime Bay, and we were usually supersonic in the climb all the way up. And I seem to remember a figure of rate of climb of 45,000 feet a minute. Yet, five months later, on November the 6th, 1958, came a shock. The Lockheed Starfighter was declared the winner of the NATO contest. The announcement was made by the German Federal Defense Minister, Franz Josef Strauss, in Bonn. Even in Germany, experts were surprised. I was training the German naval air arm in Germany at the time when they decided they needed a change of aircraft. And the aircraft chosen by the Luftwaffe was the F-104. And for the sake of standardization, it was imposed on the German naval air arm. I certainly did not believe that was the right aircraft for them. Despite this, Germany ordered 66 F-104s from Lockheed and made plans to build 210 more in Germany itself. Lockheed admitted that over time it had paid out some $22 million in sales commissions to bribe foreign government officials to buy its aircraft. The decision to buy the F-104 was marred by real human tragedy, resulting in disaster. 270 Luftwaffe planes lost and 110 pilots killed. Now, a fatal tragedy was to strike what was left of the British rocket plane project. The SR-53 hit a row of telegraph poles, killing Booth instantly. After the crash, the SR-53 test program was shut down. The rocket fighter had flown for the last time. The last remaining SR-53, testimony of a lost dream, lies in the Museum of the British Royal Air Force in Cosford, England. Its big brother, the SR-177, has been forgotten by history. Another of the planes that never flew. <laughs>